So good morning. Muy buenos días a todos. Thank you all for joining me today as we launch, uh, relaunch the uh, Maryland Latinos Unidos member discussion. Um, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, we're going to really sort of open it up to a combination of points of milestones to celebrate, um, but also um, what we're looking to do moving forward and what we're facing right now in terms of current affairs. So uh, as you well know, and you just heard our lovely music, we are in the month of Hispanic heritage. Uh, from September to 15th to October 15th, every year we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month. And this year, the title of the month that has been given to it is Be Proud of Your Past and Embrace the Future. And that is precisely what we are going to do here at Maryland Latinos Unidos today. Um, we, um, it's a time to lift up uh, accomplishments. And one thing I want to point out to everyone with regards to the Latino population is what we do contribute not only to the United States, but to Maryland and economically. We uh, bring in about $2.3 trillion in GDP. That is trillion with a T, not with a B. Um, but it's also an important month because we celebrate our culture uh, and our social traditions that are so much part of our heritage. Um, I encourage all of you to attend events. Uh, there's a lot of music events going on. There's a lot of museum events. Um, I think it would be great. Uh, it's a great way to learn and it's um, a great way to get kids involved and just to open eyes to what is out there and who your neighbors are and where they come from. Um, we're also celebrating another big milestone, which is it is our first year anniversary. Maryland Latinos Unidos is one year old. Yes, we are no longer infants. We are toddlers. And uh, wait till our terrible twos is all I have to say. Get ready, folks, as we're going to hit it with solar, not gas. Um, so <laughs> um, as we celebrate the, this anniversary, I just want to, you know, lift up a little bit of how this process went through. Um, for those of you who don't know the story, um, about I think 75 to 80 community activists, and you'll hear Veronica share a little bit more about this, came together uh, last year and they really, you know, they really wanted to see change, not only for the state, but also some kind of infrastructure built to really be able to respond to crises. We we're at the, you know, it was still just a year into the pandemic. It was so many things going on. So many people had died, still didn't have vaccines. I mean, it's just a whole host of crazy. Um, so, you know, kudos to them for their vision in um, raising up these important issues and to Maryland nonprofits for being willing to house us and to help us build the infrastructure and to guide us a little bit. Um, we're all learning as we go forward. Um, it's really been phenomenal. Um, I think one of the things that um, we also need to think about is um, a fun fact, because it's not all tough stuff. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but next time you eat your avocado toast, guess where that avocado came from? Latin America. Anytime you eat a pasta with red sauce, those tomatoes, they come from Latin America. Um, Imagine Valentine's Day without chocolate. Where does chocolate come from? Mexico. So, <laughs> and uh, which is also where I was born, uh, though I was raised in Puerto Rico. So as you can see, you know, if you think about it, those Iowa cornfields, that corn is also from Latin America, so many things. And next time you eat a French fry, yes, those potatoes came from the Andes. So, or originated there. They're probably now from Idaho. But the point <laughs> is our food, our food really evolves us uh, as humanity. We, we adapt, we take them, we add our flavors, we make them ours, but they really unify us in so, so many ways. Um, I mean, I believe salsa now has overpassed ketchup in terms of the most condiment used, uh, which is pretty cool. <laughs> um, so, um, I also want us to think a little bit about where we stand right now in terms of national affairs, uh, current affairs. Um, we're facing, today is a big day. We may be facing another government shutdown. How will that affect the state? How will that affect us? None of us know, um, but we've been through other of these crises and, um, and we'll get through it the same way we've done before. 
on immigration just this week the biden administration um on monday took steps to save the daca program daca are your dreamers and um at the very least uh, it's going to shield hundreds of thousands of these dreamers from deportation now he also made it very clear that it's up to congress to take action so bear in mind that there's a possibility that uh there's a component of the Build Back Better infrastructure bill that will include uh, the immigration part, but of course it's all in litigation at this point on the Hill. Um, we're also seeing that um, Build Back Better bill, as I said, of that's gonna be great. That's gonna be new jobs. That's gonna mean, um, you know, green jobs. That's gonna be something that's gonna help us all to address climate change, but also um, hopefully get us through to some other spaces. Um, and I wanna raise the Build Back Better bill because, um, you know, one of the things to think about is it's also includes soft infrastructure. And what they mean by that are modifications to Medicare, um, you know, to ensure that we have the kind of healthcare staff that we need to help us now as we grow older, um, but also, um, you know, childcare, which is so important. So many women, especially Latinas, have lost their jobs during this pandemic. Um, one of the things we know is that um, without considerable changes in job protection and safety net programs, the economic potential of our communities is really going to continue to be limited and circumspected. So these are important issues. Um, I think, um, <laughs> what, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, let's see, I did that. Um, so today we have two very special guests, Veronica Kuhl and Katina Rojas Joy. A little bit about them. Veronica is the founder of Maryland Latinos Unidos, uh, and her and this amazing team, my steering committee and all the, um, folks who volunteered their time, that's 80 group, a group of 80 who came together to talk about what the state needed. Um, she is the founder, because she's also a business entrepreneur. She's the founder of Cool and Associates. And what I love about her business is that it offers full service management consulting around Hispanic strategy, workforce development, education, marketing, etc. And this is great because it helps everybody engage with our community and it helps advance our community, but it also helps everybody in their businesses, in their nonprofits, and in their government jobs. Um, I also want to tell you a little bit about Katina, and um, she she's a somebody I've known for a while. Uh, we worked together in the past, um, but Katina was originally hired by the Maryland Department of um, I was going to say education. I'm sorry, Katina, <laughs> health. <laughs> Uh, new job um, as an advisor to support efforts in vaccinating vulnerable populations, specifically in Prince George's. But since then, her job has expanded. She really has taken on a much broader portfolio, and she is doing this amazing job in helping our most vulnerable get not only get vaccinated, but you know, this is really about healthcare equity, and she is at the center of this kind of work. So I want to welcome you both and um, get started with a few questions. So I'll start with you, Veronica. Dale. Are you ready? <laughs> so Maryland Latinos Unidos, as I said, is celebrating our one year anniversary. Um, what does that mean to you? Uh, maybe you could share with us why this was so important for you to create and what you hope it means for us moving forward. You know, the means it means so, so much. Um, the short, short story about everything you said is, I'm Dominican, so Palante Lo Caribeño and Happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, my father passed away three years ago and you guys may have shared, may have heard the story before. And when we delivered his body to say goodbye in the DR, people came up to me um, out of the blue. I hadn't been back in many, many years. And I only go back for a couple of days. So random strangers, he had left that small town 50 years ago and random strangers would come up and go, Tú eres la hija de Juan Anun. are you Juan Namlin's daughter? And I was like, yeah, yeah. He goes, let me tell you what your father did for us. And I'm going to tell you it was about half a dozen, eight, 10 people that did that to me the five days I was there. And I realized, oh my gosh, if something happens to me today, would anyone do that to my children? So it made me think that for 30 years that I've been in Maryland, 25, 30 years, 
we've done beautiful work, many of us on the phone, many of us. But what I notice is that the work isn't always sustainable. It's a lot of volunteer work, it's a lot of pro bono work. So it's beautiful work, but again, very, very unsustainable. And it made me think, oh my gosh, we're killing ourselves to, to put a Band-Aid on something and there's no permanence. So that was the genesis of legacy building. Um, we founded Maryland Latinos Unidos last April because of the, the COVID pandemic. You know, when we talked amongst ourselves, Elda de Bari, Cecia, Jocelyn, um, how do we fix this? We again had band-aids over there. Somebody was working on it. Somebody was giving food over here. Somebody was doing, you know, housing assistance over there, but there was nothing coordinated, nothing permanent. And um, it was time to stop that. So we created Maryland Latinos Unidos. We kissed a lot of frogs and ended up marrying Maryland nonprofit associations. And uh, a lot of strong partners came to the table to get to racial equity and realize that the gaps the Hispanic community was suffering were unnecessary. So MedStar, Johns Hopkins, Dream Management. So along with these organizations and, and, and incredibly generous Latinos, you know, Alberto Grossmark, Luis Gutierrez, um, Ines Stewart, we stepped up. And we formed this organization and we hired Dr. Gabriela Limas because we realized that on a volunteer basis, nothing is sustainable. You know, we all got to eat. You know, what if you get pregnant? What if you get fired? What if you get married? What if you get divorced? What if you get a job? You can't keep doing it. So everything we were doing for the last 30 years has been patchwork and band-aid. So I'm beyond over the moon to see Maryland Latinos Unidos living so, so effectively, work impacted um, across the state. It doesn't involve me. It doesn't involve Luis, Alberto, Jocelyn, Cecia. It's its own machine. So when I'm long gone, nobody will remember any of this, but I know that our group of, 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 of community leaders said, no, 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 ya se acabo, it's enough. And we created something that stands on its own. So um, for me, it's an honor. For me, it's, it's, um, it's a gift to see that we created something that will outlive us. So really happy about our one year anniversary. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Veronica. Um, let me ask you, Katina. Um, so as you heard, as you know, as you've probably been living and breathing, Katina, it is Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, at the end of this, we're all going to deny we're Hispanics, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> but um, so what, um, maybe tell us a little bit about in your position at the Maryland Department of Health, how are you all celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month? Um, what is the, what is, what, what do you see moving forward um, for our community um, in the healthcare space? Um, mm -hmm. And, um, and what, what, what new things are, are coming up our way or uh, what should we know that maybe we don't know as well as we could? So before I start, I'll say two things. I remember when, well, first of all, I've known Veronica for many years. She is my sister. And I tell people that I remember when she called me 13, 14 months ago with this idea and her example about her father passing because our parents passed around the same time it's word for word what she said to me then, or what she says now. Uh -huh. And also, Gabby and I have a friend in common, Nancy. Every time I tell Nancy I'm on the phone with Gabby, oh my God, you know she lived in Puerto Rico. Yes, Nancy, <laughs> we all know that Gabby is like half Puerto Rican. So anyway, <laughs> um, in the context of, well, first of all, I'm off today. I'm on vacation and I'm doing this because I love Veronica and Gabby so much. But I also, the mission of Malvec, the mission of Maryland Latinos Unidos, and the people on this call, and their goal and aim to strengthen our nonprofits, I think is critical for our, what we're trying to do. I came on board at a time where the COVID vaccination rates for Latinos was not equitable. And the leadership identified that. So they wanted someone to come on board. And really the crisis was Prince George's. And it's not my opinion, this isn't proprietary information. You can just look up what the Latino COVID rates were in Prince George's back in February, March, and April. 
Um, and one of the first things that we did, and look, I operate in a large government, so I report up, but Secretary Schrader was very committed. So the first thing that he did was strengthen the partnership with Gaza and provided Gaza de Maryland with tools needed to broaden their reach and utility. Because I will tell you that whatever success any state department of health has had in this country delivering vaccines, the nonprofit sector is a core component of that success. And that could be a faith-based community. It could be a, non, a nonprofit that caters to young people, to our retirees. So Secretary Schrader deserves a lot of credit for recognizing that Gaza was an established partner in the state, that Gaza reaches not only our international and immigrant communities, but also our asylees and refugees. Mm -hmm. People trust Gaza. Um, and they had strong clinical partnerships. So that was the first thing that the Maryland Department of Health did. And that just didn't impact Latinos. As you all know, Gaza has serves a significant African population. There are immigrants and their asylees and their refugees. And we did some really good work in Prince George's. So then my role expanded um, and it's taken a couple of iterations but current day, I now have responsibility over Montgomery County, which is our most populous county um, in the state. And I also have responsibility of, over Garrett and Allegheny, which is a 98% white Caucasian and it borders West Virginia. Um, but all you have to do is look this up. It's not confidential info. Um, Garrett and Allegheny now have, um, their cases are increasing. So even though this is Hispanic Heritage Month and we're Latino or we're allies of the Latino community, this still is a public health crisis. Um, so yes, I don't just help Latinos as we shouldn't because we're allies, we help everybody. But Allegheny and Garrett are also a good example of poverty um, and, and misinformation. And we still have a lot of work to do. Montgomery County and through this really, the county deserves all the credit the county council created a Salud y Benestar or a community nonprofit that was funded through the county council. And if any of you now go on and just look at the COVID vaccination rates in Montgomery County for Latinos, they, the, I would say that Montgomery County has the highest vaccination rate for Latinos statewide in part because it was a great marriage between the county council, the nonprofit sector and community leaders. And they put their money um, where their mouth is. So this is a shared responsibility. That's great. Um, this is a shared responsibility amongst the federal government, the state department of health and all of the county departments of health. So I'll leave you with sort of the infrastructure. If anyone on this call would like to activate a vaccination clinic, I will put the link in the chat, but also we have to work with our local health departments. Our lo local health departments have vaccines. They may not have infrastructure by way of a mobile van or nurses or generator or tents, but empower your local health department first and ask them. They might say, look, we can't come out for only 20 people. Perhaps we can work together. And if you only have 20 people, we will work with you to get them an appointment. But if it's 30 plus, and work with your local health departments and then you can reach out to MDH and I'm more than happy to work with you to activate a vaccination clinic statewide. It just doesn't have to be Garrett, Allegheny um, or Montgomery because to Gabby's first question in terms of what we're doing, we are still looking for people. We have the vaccine, so it's no longer vaccine finding, it's people finding. You want help, I will help you because that's what the Department of Health um, is committed to doing. That's great, Katina. And you know, and this is, I guess, kind of a general question to both you and Veronica related to the vaccinations. It's really the message, right? Um, and the, how we communicate to the community about um, the vaccine and, and, you know, obviously there's hesitancy. There's also 
misinformation, disinformation. Do you guys have any thoughts or ideas about how best ways, best practices that you could well, share with how, us that we much, could utilize much, for many things? How much time do we have? So, oh yeah, I should have known. Uh, let me, let <laughs> She's me, a communication let me, strategist. What do you let, let me <laughs> Let me clarify a little bit, right? So a couple of thoughts. So my company, Cool & Associates, we created the company 10 years ago because in every setting, I was often the only Latina that many non-Hispanics had ever met. So they would ask me really simple questions. And, and I founded the company because the questions were repetitive. Where are Hispanics? Why don't they come over? Why don't they apply? Why don't they use our services? And I would give them logical answers. Oh, are the materials in Spanish? Do you have bilingual staff? Is the phone number in Spanish? Is the reading level the right reading mm -hmm, level? Mm -hmm. Because there's just so much information out there that we don't comprehend. And translations right. are very, very poorly done. You know, you seem to think that because Veronica speaks Spanish, she can translate. And we know that that's not the case. I may know enough Spanish to get by, but not proper Spanish to write and do press releases and so forth. So where I'm going with this is there is an obvious lack in building that bridge to connect the Department of Housing, Health, Education, doesn't matter. And I'm not pointing fingers at anyone. I'm simply stating as an example to connect to Latinos. So the answer is consistent outreach in the right language that is culturally and linguistically appropriate. And it's not a firework. So if we want parents to trust the vaccine, if we have parents to participate in, in the rental assistance program, if we want people to do anything, it has to be repetitive. It's marketing 101. I think the last that I saw it, it takes 13 times for you seeing mm -hmm, something mm -hmm. to go, oh, look at that, it's brand new. And you're like, mm. <laughs> we said it 13 times, but that, that's normal. My point is, to engage people to get movement on vaccines and avoid or improve the hesitancy, we need to be consistently where they are. Facebook, mm -hmm. social media, community events, churches, barberias, hair salons, peluquerias, barbershops. And what's happening is we're not. We'll send a random Katina once a year and people go, Huh, maybe she'll come back again. I didn't get everything she said. Maybe she'll come back next week. And most people do not return. So the community has a, a lack of, we don't trust. We've been cheated. We've been ignored. So they're waiting to see if this is a real committed relationship. So I'm speaking very slowly because I've said this 185 times. And, <laughs> and it, it's frustrating because I continue to see folks going, how come they don't get vaccinated? Why won't they do the program? Why won't they apply for the job? We don't know you want us. We don't know you want us. You, we don't know we qualify. The system isn't made for us. So when I click on something, it doesn't show it easy for me, especially if I have language issues or cultural issues. I don't know that that's for me. So it's a missed opportunity. So how do we get parents to, to say yes? Inform them in the right language. Really, really emphasize that this is for family. That's one of our strongest values is the love of family. We prioritize family over everything else. If you try to sell something about me, I don't care about me. But if you tell me my children are going to be impacted, hold up, hold up. <laughs> then I start paying attention. So if anyone wants to engage the Latino community, the first thing is understanding who they are. Is it an immigrant? Is it a recently arrived immigrant? Are they contending with legal situations? Do they speak fluent Spanish or not? What do they need and how do they comprehend information? and then consistently engage them where they are. So hopefully that that that, that kind of sinks in. I know a lot of us on the phone, on the Zoom know that, but um, that's why I started the company because that consistency and that appropriate engagement wasn't there. You wanna add anything, Katina? No, I agree. Um, I think as a whole, governments um, are, I hope, Trying that governments are no are working to keep up with the changing demographic mm. of, of this country. Important. And, um, you know, when you look at, we're not just the Northeast and the West Coast. Um, so obviously 
in some parts of the country, governments have done a really good job that all levels of a government reflect that. Um, but to Veronica's point, if governments in this country, so you figure a state government has 10 to 20 agencies. In the best case scenario, a senior person of color, Latino, it doesn't matter, should have a position, not as a contractor, as an established civil servant, a merit employee, at each, if not all of the agencies within the state government in this country, especially if they're external facing. Go ahead, Beto. The, the, you guys have heard me say this a million times, money. So part of the reason that the issue persists is that there's not allocated resources. So now that we have the American Rescue Act, um, if you're not registered for the Maryland Nonprofit Association Conference, at the end of October, it's a virtual conference. We'll talk a lot about these resources. But if you are not, if you're a decision maker, if it's money's not in your budget allocated to community outreach, language services, staffing, this, this issue will persist. What we keep doing, and the reason Maryland Latinos Unidos was born is because everything was pro bono. We're doing the same thing at work, whether at government, whether nonprofits, whether corporations. We're hoping to reach a, a, a segment, Latinos, without dedicating the resources. Then you wonder why it doesn't work. So Katina saying you should have a dedicated Hispanic liaison. You should have a dedicated marketing Spanish outreach. You should, and, and whether your market is Polish, you know, African-American, Asian-American, it doesn't matter. Whatever that flavor is, you should have representation in the seats of power and in a consistent budget. I can't say that enough because we keep asking people, when I was in corporate, Veronica, can you go do the Latino thing? Veronica, can you review this translation? Veronica, can you present tonight, this weekend, this Sunday? As I'm still doing my full-time job. So I was doing three jobs with no extra pay. Burnout, it's inconsistent. Right. So I, what I hear from both of you, um, watch, rinse, repeat, right? Uh, keep that message going, um, you know, just because you're repeating it, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. It takes at least 13 times. Uh, we need representation in uh, every agency uh, to really start making the shift. And we need the resources to be able to pay those lovely people because uh, as a former Department of Labor worker. <laughs> uh, I would never uh, not pay uh, people for their good hard work. Um, so um, good communications, uh, consistency, uh, representation, and resources um, to be uh, in, in short. So let's shift a little bit to the economic side. Um, I, you know, I'm, I mentioned about job loss during this pandemic. And, um, and yet I also mentioned the great economic contributions that we are all making. Um, but one thing we noted during the um, pandemic was that uh, Latinas in particularly uh, lost their jobs. I'm gonna put a link here to an article uh, about women and work. It's more broad and uh, it's from different countries, but it gives, it's the same thing that's happened here. And what we learned is that um, you know, Latinas, not only as, as all women uh, and, and men, I, uh, not only do we have to take care of our, our jobs, but we also must take care of our families. And so uh, the challenge with the schools shutting down meant lack of, you know, lack of childcare. Um, I think there for a minute, we just didn't know what the next step was gonna be, how long the quarantine would last. Um, we're starting to come out of that. It's gonna be a process. I keep, you know, we can't get totally excited. It's a process. Uh, this disease has more variants than um, some women have hairstyles. <laughs> but, um, and that's, you know, it's a sad thing about this virus. Um, and um, I think um, one of the things with the women losing their jobs is it's impacted their health, right? Um, we, we've also seen a number of women who were not taking care of their chronic conditions. So you see re increases in breast cancer, et cetera, and other chronic conditions. Um, diabetes continues. Um, how has it impacted your jobs? Um, I mean, yourselves as, as Latinas personally, but also 
what are you seeing when you when you talk to your colleagues when you go to work um, or your clients um, what are they telling you Dale, Katina. Um, <clears throat> well look I always I I acknowledge my privilege privilege that I was born as an American privilege that I only need a government ID or driver's license to get on a plane privilege mm -hmm. that I identify with the gender that I was born privilege that I have insurance privilege that I know how to drive a car privilege that I know the police probably aren't going to stop my boys because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. So the I have a response for your question, but I respond to that question not as a part of that group because I am privileged. Um, broadly, I will say Latinos have been devastated by COVID in this country. The mortality rate for Latinos is the highest. It hovers at around 112,000 Latinos have died of COVID, followed by African-Americans, it's around 96, 97,000. And I think that data is fairly, you know, fairly recent uh, as of the, the last two weeks. Um, moreover, and now I say we, even though I have a comfortable job at home, I don't pick, you know, I'm not in the crops, but I will say we, because I'm proximate and care about our communities. If we're deemed essential, we're deemed essential because our peoples clean our floors, mm. they serve our fast food, they work in our meat plants, they do our laundry, and they are out there in 110 degrees because climate change is changing. And whereas maybe our ag workers would have to pick our crops in 90 degree heat, now it's 105. Um, so essentially, in it comes with a heavy price to be deemed essential in the context of COVID. So while I was very comfortable in my house prior to the vaccine being approved, who was delivering the DoorDashes and the Uber Eats? More likely than not, it was our Latino community. And then in some parts of the country, probably Asian, Ethiopian, Eritrean, um, Nepalese. But yeah, it has been, absolutely devastating because our community mm. represents a job sector that invariably means interacting with other people. Um, and moreover, you know, if, if you live in a middle class or upper middle class suburb, or if you live in a middle class or upper middle class urban environment, just travel two or, you know, a two or three miles into your local you know, federally subsidized section eight housing project to see how mm. our people are living. Because in many parts of the country, you know, I don't, if you live on the Upper East Side and you're doing well and you have the option to go to the Hamptons during the pandemic, that's great. But that is not the case for most of our poor, undocumented residents in this country. So the long answer around economics, Gabby, is that our poor, our vulnerable, our undocumented residents, doesn't matter if they're Latino or not, but in this case, they are mostly Latino. Yeah, it comes at a heavy price when you're deemed essential because essentially you're a target in the context of COVID. Um, mm. We don't have insurance. Wow. We don't speak the language. Um, so it is very difficult to navigate. Now I say that as a private citizen, I don't say that as a representative of the Maryland Department of Health. Because, you know, that is just my personal opinion as someone just with Veronica. So before the vaccine was approved, Veronica and I were doing food distributions when the pandemic hit. So we saw the long lines early on of people who never thought they would need a free meal and people who were, um, they were uh, humbled mm -hmm. that the community stepped in to provide you know, a, a hot meal. But yeah, it has impacted our community in a horrific manner because all of that essential work means that we either had to work and test positive, or if you worked in the service industry or hospitality, it meant you were unemployed. And remember, right. if you are here without legal status, you don't qualify. Right. Some states are better than others, um, but you don't qualify for anything. I'll That's flip right. that around. All of those things are true and 
I validate everything Katina said. On the professional side, the professional side, I would say the, the white collar. Um, Gabriela, you asked a question, what's the impact to Latinas in this crisis? So I think it has been positive, you know, and, and forgive me, right? Forgive me, see it in context, right? I'm not happy about the deaths. I'm not happy about the illnesses. I'm not happy about the unemployment. But what I have discovered and have seen is we continue to be a resourceful group. So mm -hmm. if it, X wasn't working, that's why when people ask me the question, what's your biggest failure? And I go, none, I've never failed because I fall. <laughs> I stand up, wipe myself up, learn, and do it differently. So every single failure has been a, a lesson learned. So what I've noticed is my company grew. We were doing a lot more translation, a lot more community outreach because the world realized, oh my gosh, if we don't get Latinos in here, we're not going to get X, whatever that X is. I've seen Latinas grow and expand. It's a double, it's a double answer because there's a desperate need for representation and, and we're eager to work. But I've also seen extreme mental health and extreme pressure because mm -hmm. we're natural nurturers. So yeah. I'm at home caring for my kids, running a company, establishing a nonprofit. I ended up getting a therapist last December. And as we know in the Latino culture, there's mega stigma around mental health. And as a matter of fact, I'm having a session tomorrow, I'll put it on the link, where there's a Dominican psychologist, Dr. Angelica uh, Perez Litwin, who joined me to talk about just the fact that Latinas are trailblazers, but she founded a, a wellness mental health clinic, Lumen Center. It's national, so you guys check it out. But the point is, to answer your question, I'm like, it's a lot. You're doing a hundred million things and there's no outlet because we're not supposed to be weak. We're not yeah. supposed to be, um, we can't stumble and you can't talk about it. And the fact that I said I took a therapist, oh my God, I'm only expecting the text messages and Facebook to be like, Veronica está loca. Veronica no está loca. Veronica needs an outlet, as we all do. And the fact is, we don't normalize our, our mental well being. And if I'm not healthy, if I don't put my oxygen mask, I can't help you. If right. I'm not healthy, I can't make a Maryland Latinos Unidos grow. So, to, to just bring it in a little bit, this pandemic has really brought to light what's important in life. And if you are a professional Latino that straddles both the American and the Latino world, like most of us on the phone, you see both sides. You see the privilege of being comfortable and getting that paycheck at home in your pajamas and working and you know being able to not have to commute and everything is a little easier because you're not juggling so much but then you're not the essential worker that's on the ground, you know, exposed. So you, you see it both and it's heart wrenching. Heather has had some, some pretty incredible meetings with Maryland nonprofits where your heart breaks when you see the trauma. Mm -hmm. So I'm answering the question and, and I want to make it all doom and gloom. We're resourceful. We're tough. We will be on the other side. No doubt. But damn, are there scars? Right. <laughs> so just a little patience and tolerance for folks. Um. You know, really, and I'm seeing it in the chat, several people are thanking you for being open about it. And it's about, you know, we're all going through a lot and um, we have to remove those stigmas. It doesn't mean you're weak, if anything else, it means you're strong because you acknowledge your, your vulnerabilities and you're looking for those tools to help you address them. And really for me, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a lot of things, but I'm a problem solver. And so whenever I see something, I try to figure out how, how can I address that so that it's less burdensome and actually can maybe be turned into something positive. Um, and um, mental health is always such a challenge in our community. Um, and in many communities, and it's not just the Latino community, it's, it's a lot of places. Um, it's, yeah, estoy loca, that I'm crazy. No, it's not about being crazy. It's about actually being healthy. <laughs> and it's, uh, there, you know, it, it's, we struggle. We have to figure out what we're going to do next. It's an outlet. It's an outlet. It's not even it's, a struggle. We go to the doctor when we're sick. We take a flu shot. We, we get glasses when we can't see. So why wouldn't I get an outlet? <laughs> why wouldn't I get emotional support when it's a lot? And it's, it's a, it's a global pandemic. It's a demasiado, global pandemic. Demasiado. It's demasiado. Um, which, you know, I, yeah, I mentioned earlier in my, my discussion about government shutdown. I'm going to, it's a weird segue, but there's a logic to it in my brain anyway. 
um, you know, we're facing a government shutdown, right? And um, and I I hope I I hope they they raise the debt ceiling and all of that um, things that they're supposed to do. Um, you know, not my circus, not my monkeys, um, but they um, that does have an impact on us. And I was just wondering, has this concerned you at all that it, what it could mean for your business? or your work at uh, the state health department has the state health department um, I means they pretty much keep going, right? Like the whole world isn't just gonna shut down. Correct. And also um, the way operations, so the Maryland Department of Health is not like HHS as Gabby knows. HHS is a massive global federal agency with, I don't know if they have hundreds of thousands but certainly thousands and thousands of employees and bureaus and offices, if you log on now and just Google Maryland Department of Health org chart, it is not a very large agency. Um, and they obviously they do other things besides COVID. So mm -hmm. I am on the COVID recovery engagement side, which is like a very, very small part. Um, and because most, I am, I am in the office twice a week in, on Preston in Baltimore. Um, but you know, 90% of us are still virtual. So while we, we all hear about the potential, how it impacts my work day to day, it won't. Um, now, if, you know, I'm sure we would receive guidance otherwise, but, you know, yesterday, tomorrow, and the next day, it's business as usual. But yes, to Gabby's point, I hope, because Gabby and I lived through a shutdown. Gabby and I worked for the Obama administration when it, you know, and we were home for like two to three weeks and I think there was another shutdown in the previous administration, if I'm not correct. Mm -hmm. um, but to Gabby's question for Veronica, are you concerned? You know, if you all just think of all of those small businesses that support federal buildings, state buildings, the tech sector in Northern California and old urban cities where they were office buildings, so mm -hmm. if there is a government shutdown, it will punctuate the already devastating effects that working from home has had on our small businesses that are the heartbeats of these commercial sectors um, with large office buildings that are completely vacant now. So all you have to do is walk through your community and more likely than not, a Panera has closed, a Starbucks has closed, a dry cleaners has closed. Um, and even though these are large um, corporations or modeled after franchises, these are still people, people who have to pay their bills. And some of us might spend $10 on two cups of coffee, but $10 is what they make an hour. So right. I, yeah, I am always concerned for the ecosystem. And also I'm concerned on the pressure it puts on nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Our nonprofits were already, and I'm not Our talking about the big ones with the endowments. No, 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 that's chiquitas. Yeah, I'm talking about the ones that do the brick and mortar. Like us. <laughs> yes. But also, Veronica and I both know, if it wasn't for our nonprofits before the vaccine was approved, we never could have given the thousands of meals that we distributed. Um, and my hat's off to World Central Kitchen because in my personal opinion, World Central Kitchen, along with our smaller ones like Seed and Sea Car and um, yes, Tata and LAYC, all of our nonprofits across the state are devastated. So I'm always concerned when there's anything with shutdown, how that's gonna impact, because who's gonna be mm -hmm. their voice and who is going to oh. advocate for them? Let me remind everyone that, that we're a capitalistic society, right? And yes, our US government is the largest employer, the largest pot of money that we have. Check, check, check. But we got a lot of money. So over $2.1 trillion uh, Latinos and Latino, I'm not even counting the non-Latinos that are here. We control a lot of money. So let's pretend that the government shuts down, right? Let's pretend for a second. We still can choose where we spend our money. So mm -hmm. be mindful. 
I'm not saying your $20 meal is going to save the restaurant down the street, but if every one of us buys their $20 meal from that local restaurant versus the versus the uh, big box or the larger entity, we can impact it. It's going to be tough. And Katina said it all, you know, small businesses that rely on government contract. For me and my business, blessedly, I have a, a nice diversification where I have government, nonprofit, state, all kinds of different customers. So that's a lesson that we, we have to learn. If, if you depend on government income as a business, as a nonprofit, any kind of revenue stream, you need to diversify it. It's gonna right. be tough. Um, but I think individually, we can do our little bit of nuestro granito de sal, ¿verdad? arena. Um, sí, claro. Go spend your money. Go spend your money in local businesses so we can hold them up a little bit. I love that. Um... I love that. I think, you know, I'm thinking of the loncheras, who's the little carts that are outside and they, that, you know, in the government buildings yeah, and everywhere else. And, and, you know, the little camiones, um, those are my, some of my favorite lunch spots. Um, they're, they're going to be impacted. So this, I mean, it's the one time where I see a, a trickle down effect um, yeah. economically. <laughs> Sadly, it's a negative one, not a positive one. Um, so we're, we're, we're at five, we're almost at ten, a little, uh, seven minutes, I think. Um, and um, I was wondering if you, either of you, what are your final thoughts on all of this? What should we be looking forward to? Um, we at MLU, we, we have a lot that we wanna share, but I think it's up to you two to also help us, help us help you. <laughs> Dale, Katina, you close. Um, so, uh, I will always straddle between my personal opinion and, and speaking for the Maryland Department of Health. But in, in a professional capacity, we are working on two big projects. Um, I can't speak about them now um, in an effort to continue to help our immigrants, our international, our asylum, our refugees, our most vulnerable communities. Mm -hmm. The more to come on that in Malvec and Maryland Latinos Unidos um, would be a part of that. You know, I would say two things that it's not a cliche. If you are not at the table, you get eaten for lunch. Representation matters, advocacy matters. Um, so we have to advocate for our institutions. We have to advocate for our organizations. We have to advocate for our nonprofits. Yeah. I, I, could, I cannot, whatever success looks like, um, you know, we cannot achieve this uh, urgent goal of getting reaching 70, 80% vaccination rate without the help of our, our nonprofits. And our nonprofits need assistance with capacity building, governance. Um, and I am not a fan of asking subject matter expertise leaders or our smaller consultants to do stuff for free when the entity they're doing it for is making money. So if the mm -hmm. entity is making money, then you should pay the SME or the consultant. But to our established SMEs and consultants, if you have an hour, two hours of pro bono that you are willing um, to give your intellectual um, perspective, curiosity, your, inter your expertise, you know, please consider donating that time to build up the infrastructure of our nonprofits, the governance of our nonprofits, you know, the, the developmental piece, which is fundraising. Um, our nonprofits are not private family foundations with 30, 40, 60, 70 million dollars. Right. Our many of our nonprofits, the staff, I don't they don't make a lot of money. You know, I don't know if a hundred thousand dollars is a lot of money, but it is not a lot of money for an executive director who's putting in 120 hours a week. Um, so I would the two takeaways is representation yeah. matters at all levels. Um, and we have to collectively do a better job at supporting our uh, nonprofits and scaling them back. And one last example. So we all know that McKenzie um, has a very surgical, strategic, research-based team that is deciding who is getting um, the millions and billions of dollars um, that she has as a result of the dissolution of her marriage. So many of us on this call, we know those teams of people that are sitting and evaluating the capacity of the nonprofit. So Hispanics in Philanthropy got 15 million. Howard University got 50 million. 
Lehman College and the Bronx got 20 million. So if someone on this call knows that team that is research, analyzing, vetting, give them a call and say, hey, here's a list of five to 10 organizations in the climate change space, in the leadership development space, really in good. the immigration space, in the prison to pipeline space. And I think that these organizations could benefit from you evaluating their capacity to absolve and receive $5 million, $50 million, $100 million. If we don't make those meaningful connections, many of our nonprofits are going to struggle and not be able to provide the essential services that they do. Well, and, and to expand on that, and by the way, Katina, you always have the most strategic advice in the planet. So somebody <laughs> needs to find uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife, Mackenzie, and find her research team. And <laughs> just, you know, llamen. Y me llaman no, a and we know, we know who many of those... No, 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 pero la conexión, la conexión. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to close this out, um, the future of MLU depends on the community. This is right. our, our collective uh, voice. So the folks that are on, you know, we on average have 30 to 40 to 50 people on these calls from across the state, really, real impactful, connected partners. We got to put our money and our intentions where our mouths are. So Gabriela and her mighty, mighty team, um, small, growing. Mini um, team, can't, but great. <laughs> can't do it all. So we love to complain as a community. Que no me dieron, you don't have it, you don't give me, you don't have. But when it comes to unifying and, and, and creating numbers in America and the US, we know that it's about numbers and saying, oh, we have a thousand members. We represent the 650,000 Hispanics in the state of Maryland. That's 744. Powerful. 744, <laughs> thank you for the updated number. But we are not cohesive. It's an opportunity for us to become members. And, and if you don't have the money in your budget, if you can't afford it, we can offer scholarships, but it's getting involved. Take a seat at that table. If you're not invited, if you don't know where the room is, ask us because we need more representation. We're working on a green bag project when there's an opportunity to name or recommend a Latino to join a board. So you're at the table creating program and, 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 and advocating for the rest of the community. It can't just be Katina, Veronica, and Gabriela. We're, we're swapped. So if you wanna get involved, get involved. If you wanna see change, get involved. If it's not you, bring someone else in. You don't have to do everything. I'm not asking for you to do what you cannot do. Pero si tienes un jovencito, there's a young person that wants to get their hands, you know, they want to get dirty. They want to work. Send them in. Send them in. We have so many jobs. We have so much opportunity. We have so many nonprofit committee seats, boards, and that's the stepping stone to the positions of power that change things permanently. That's right. Please get involved. Please get involved. That is such a great segue for me because um, you took the words right out of my mouth for one. Um, it is all about us being involved. It, it is all about us having a seat on the table. I put something in the chat. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> somehow I just don't feel like I want to be somebody's burrito. But anyway, um, so let's... <laughs> Let's look forward. Um, we have a lot coming up as the year uh, it wraps up. We're in our last quarter. Um, we are going to begin as Maryland Latinos Unidos a cafecito virtual, a Spanish language, uh, you know, kind of a mini version of this um, to really start also speaking directly to our Spanish dominant friends. Um, to, to bring them up to date and, and to have this community feeling um, and, and, you know, it's a cafecito. It's about having a chat. And uh, we're, I'm also planning an executive sort of uh, executive uh, director quarterly meeting that hopefully I can bring together local uh, government officials and, and people in positions of authority at the county and municipal level to talk about the Latino community to ensure that we're not on the menu, but at the table. Um, and uh, to Veronica, you just added this whole green bag piece. Um, we are looking to build, I'm not sure if it's going to be a task force, a working group, however, and we would love your input on what that could look like. But for these green bag commissions and the green bag commission, 
uh, are basically appointments that the governor makes that he has to submit to the state legislature. And we need to get Latinos into these commissions. Um, there's a number of them coming up. Um, uh, especially, uh, I have one I'm eyeballing on education reform um, for the Blueprint for Maryland Education. I think um, we're going to make a lot of great changes. I encourage you all to continue to join us, and um, we have a great schedule for the fall and winter. Um, we look forward to having you. Thank you, Katina. Thank you, Veronica, for being the great leaders that you are. Uh, and um, we really, uh, you know, I'm really grateful to you both for your insights um, and um, and your strategy. I mean, what else can we ask for? Um, have a great day, everyone. Happy Thanks, weekend. Gabby. Thanks, everyone. And, and we will. Gracias a todos. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month, everybody. Gracias. Que tengan lindo día y buen fin de semana.